Welcome, everybody. In this lecture, we're going to talk about what was Mar Yeshua's message to the world. Gospel is not an accurate term for Mar Yeshua's message to the world. In Greek, Yeshua's message was called the euangelion. The Latin term was evangelion. The old English term of the King James Version of the Bible was gospel, combining two words, God and spell, or God spell, which became gospel, which means word of God. The Aramaic term for Mar Yeshua's spiritual message was basor. Basor is a proclamation from the throne of God. In olden days, when a king birthed an heir to his throne, he sent a messenger throughout his kingdom to proclaim this passage or eventual transmission of royal power. This was called a basor. In Jewish religious culture contemporary with Mar Yeshua, a prophet would receive a spiritual proclamation, a basor, from God to give to the people of Israel and the greater population of the world too, in the case of Jesus. A basor was received from God to be transmitted to the world via a prophet or prophetess when such a sage successfully made a Merkaba ascent. This is an artistic rendition of a Merkaba ascent to the 10th Olam or the 10th spiritual reality, the highest heaven where God's throne is. Uh, such beings such as Isaiah, Yeshua, Ezekiel, and other prophets made this Merkaba ascent. What's a Merkaba? What's a Merkaba ascent? This may be a very new kind of terminology uh, for those of you attending this class. A Merkaba was a chariot that through mystical meditative spiritual practice lifted you consciously to the throne of God in the 10th Olam the 10th or highest heavenly sphere. <clears throat> a prophet would ascend in ecstasy to the throne of God and receive a message from God to give to humanity. The fact that the historical Jesus had a basor to give implies that he made this mystical Merkaba ascent himself. In the gospels that we have available to us, we do have at least a partial Merkaba ascent. In the transfiguration event, uh, Jesus takes James, Peter, and John up onto a mountain, and they meditate and pray. And then the disciples are blinded by this incredible light that transforms uh, spiritual Jesus' physical body into a more spiritual body. And he also sees, they also see with Jesus, Elijah and Moses, and they're all conferring together. A Merkaba ascent is really an ascent all the way up to the 10th heaven, which is where the throne of God is. So I say that this is a partial Merkaba ascent in the transfiguration event because Jesus was seeing Moses and Elijah in Pardes. Pardes is the Garden of Eden. And in the Garden of Eden is where elevated souls can, communic can commune with resurrected Jewish saints, those who had experienced the Kima. <clears throat> so here's a rendition of the disciples being blinded by the transformative light that transformed Jesus's physical body into a spiritual body. And they saw him communing with Moses and Elijah, and they were all conferring about spiritual matters. Who did the historical Jesus believe himself to be? Was Jesus God? Did Jesus think he was God? We must understand that Mar Yeshua was a Jew. The historical Jesus was a Jew. He did not want to replace the Jewish religion with something new. He wanted people to renew their covenant, their bond or relationship with God, to make a sincere return to God in the divine way. It would have been impossible for a Jewish man to conceive of himself as God. The idea and belief of Jesus being God is erroneous and was a Hellenic graft on Mar Yeshua's teachings so that it could be easily accepted by the Greek-speaking Roman Gentiles 
that early Christianity was being marketed to by Paul and others. Hellenized Roman Gentiles believed that any great hero, philosopher, or religious personage must be the result of the mating of a woman with a god. This idea would have been blasphemous and abhorrent to the historical Jesus. The historical Jesus self-identified as a Jewish prophet. In Luke chapter 4, chapters, verses 16 through 21, it is said, When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Excuse me. So a lot of churches and their dogmas will say that this passage was Jesus identifying himself as a Messiah. I disagree, and I'll show you why. He was declaring himself a prophet. Here's a beautiful image of Yeshua reading the scroll of Isaiah in the synagogue. So in Greek, the word Christ means anointed one. In Hebrew and Aramaic, it's Mashiach, which also means anointed one. And in English, we're familiar with the word Messiah, which means anointed one an anointed one of God. It is important to note carefully that Luke does not say anointed one. It says he, God, has anointed me. To be anointed by God means that you're getting a special blessing, but you're not getting the title anointed one, which is what Christ, Messiah, Messiah is. Kings were coronated in those days by anointing the crown of the head with sacred oils applied by a sage. The prophet Samuel anointed Saul, the first king of Israel, and the Hebrew Testament. So an anointing is a special blessing. And there are many different kinds of anointing that can happen for different kinds of people. But without the title anointed one, it's not necessarily pointing it to Jesus as being as Jesus identifying himself as the Christ, as a Messiah. During Mar Yeshua's Merkaba ascent, he was anointed, blessed by God, and given a basur. And the word for basur is good news. Uh, and this basur he was to bring to all of humanity, to uplift all of humanity, to create a new humanity, truly in God's image. This was his prophetic mission. If the historical Jesus identified as a Messiah, it could not have been the Davidic Messiah. If Jesus identified as a Messiah at all, when he read the scroll of Isaiah in the synagogue at Nazareth, it would not have been the warrior Messiah Ben David. Even though Paul and other gospel writers tried to frame the historical Jesus as the Davidic Messiah, Jesus himself satirized and ridiculed the idea of a Messiah ben David in the Gospel of Mark. If Jesus identified as a Messiah at all, he may have identified as a Messiah ben Joseph, a Jewish expectation of a suffering Messiah who would die for the sake of truth. However, at this early stage of Jesus's mission, it is unlikely he identified in this manner as he was yet to suffer. However, in the Gospel of Thomas, Mar Yeshua satirizes the Messiah ben Joseph too, which we'll learn about in future lectures.
Jesus ridicules the idea of a Messiah ben David. In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, verses 35 through 37, it says, while Jesus was teaching in the temple, he said, how can the scribes say that the Messiah is the son of David? David himself, by the Holy Spirit, declared, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. So how can he be his son? And a large crowd was listening to him with delight. In other words, you know, in Jewish culture and many world cultures, uh, the father is given a high level of respect by the son. So it would be inappropriate for David to call his son Lord, giving him a higher stature, is, is the word play that Jesus was using. Here, the items in red above are clarifications provided by me. Uh, they're not in the original verses found in the Gospel of Mark. But when we reread uh, this verse with my clarifications, it makes it easier to understand. While Jesus was teaching in the temple, he said, how can the scribes say that the Messiah is the son of David? David himself, by the Holy Spirit, declared, The Lord God said to my Lord, the Messiah, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord, the Messiah. So how can he, the Messiah, be his son? And the large crowd was listening to him with delight. Here's my conclusion of the historical Jesus's self-identification. Mar Yeshua was not an adherent to the Judean concept of a warrior Messiah ben David, and therefore did not historically identify as such. It is unlikely Jesus would have identified as a suffering Messiah ben Joseph at the beginning of his ministry. He didn't suffer yet. And if the Gospel of Thomas is correct, he did not identify as a Messiah ben Joseph either. Therefore, the anointing was God's blessing on a Jewish prophet who was given a basor, a message from the throne of God, to dispense to humanity. What was Mar Yeshua's basor, his message or his proclamation? What did he have to say in short? In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verse 15, we see the essence of Jesus' basor. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. We have to understand that Aramaic was the language Jesus spoke and thought in. During Mar Yeshua's time on earth, Hebrew was the language of the Jewish religion, scriptures, and spiritual practices. However, the common language was Aramaic, spoken in the household, in the town halls, etc. According to Bishop Kaiser, a biblical scholar, Hebrew is akin to Old English, think Chaucer, and Aramaic is like common or contemporary English. That's the gulf between the two. To truly understand the historical teachings of Mar Yeshua, you should understand that the Christian Testament was written in Greek and then translated to English. The Greek Gentile writers of the Christian Testament did not understand Aramaic, nor the Jewish culture or religion Jesus knew and practiced. To understand Jesus' teachings, you must walk back the English to the Greek, and from the Greek, back to the words in Aramaic Jesus would have actually spoken. This is our goal throughout this course, and also in any kind of talk that I would share with you before the Liturgy of the Chalice that happens weekly. Understanding the historical Aramaic terms in Mark chapter 1, verse 15, the basor. Here we see that there are some terms that really change the meaning of what this basor means to us. 
So the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. I put in red first the Aramaic and then the English translation. The word that we that that would have been used by Jesus is Malkuth. And Malkuth does not mean a kingdom. It means kingship, rulership, sovereignty, but it does not designate a place a physical place or a new Jerusalem or anything like that. Malkuth is a spiritual consciousness. It is the inner guidance of God. It is the protection of God. It is the sovereignty of God or the rulership of God, but it is not a place. It is not a king domain. So this is very important to understand if you're going to understand the historical Jesus. Malkuth is not a kingdom. It is the sovereignty of God the omniscience, the omnipotence of God. The time is fulfilled and the sovereignty of God has come near. So Jesus's mission heralds a new start. Before Jesus came, there was the old Adam. And Adam is not like Adam and Eve. A lot of times some of my friends will always joke and say, oh, well, Adam and Eve created the whole human race. That's not true. <laughs> Adam and Eve is a spiritual allegory or a story. Adam means humanity. Adam is not a singular person. Adam is all of humanity. So God manifested humanity or the Elohim, as we'll learn later on when we study Genesis, the Elohim, which literally means gods or emanations from God, possibly archangels, they created the first humanity. And as you go through the Hebrew Testament, sometimes called the Old Testament, we see that often uh, that old humanity, Israel, fell away from God and they had to renew a covenant and renew the covenant and renew the covenant. <laughs> So Jesus is saying that a time is fulfilled uh, when we'll have a new humanity, one that will be ruled by the sovereignty of God, the Malkuth of God. And this is an inner reality. The kingdom of God is within you. The Malkuth of God is within you in your heart. So this is a time when we'll have a new humanity, a new start, and God's rulership will be in every human heart which is very beautiful. So the time is fulfilled in the kingdom, the Malkuth of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Repent is a very harsh word. It's one that a lot of contemporary people reject and rightfully so. Uh, the Aramaic word would have been naham, which means to submit. There's a difference between lovingly submitting to God and repenting from your sins. So Jesus here is saying that we should submit to God. The time is fulfilled. The sovereignty of God is near. So you should submit to this sovereignty, to the rulership of God in your heart, to this inner guidance of God within your heart, to this protection of God in your heart. And you should have fidelity with the basur. So believe is not correct, as we'll see. The Aramaic Hebrew word would have been enuma, which means to have fidelity with, to have faith in the basur or the message, the good news that Jesus was proclaiming. Jesus often taught the boss were from Peter's boat. And here's a beautiful image of Yeshua teaching the multitude from the boat. Understanding the Aramaic terms. Let's take a deeper look at these terms because it really changes the common understanding of what Jesus taught. When we understand the Aramaic thought world that Jesus would have spoken. So kingdom comes from the Greek word 
Basileon. The Aramaic would be Melkus. Melkus is not a kingdom. It is not a kingdom or a place outside of oneself. Jesus told us not to believe those who say lo here or lo there. Rather, Jesus taught the Malkuth of God is within you, within your heart, within your consciousness, within your conscience. Malkuth means the sovereignty of God, the rulership of God, and it implies the protection of God and the inner guidance of God. In the Gospel of Thomas, Mar Yeshua is quoted as having said, the sovereignty of God is spread out upon the earth, but men do not see it. In other words, it's not a physical thing you can see with your eyes. And at no time, past, present, or future, is it something that you'll see with your eyes. It's something you intuit with your heart and feel in your reality your inner reality. The next term to understand is naham. Now for the heavy word, repent, you dirty sinners. <laughs> You'll be glad to know Jesus in no way asked us to repent. Repent is the poor word used to translate the Greek metanoia. Metanoia simply means to change your mind. The Aramaic word Mar Yeshua would have used is naham. Naham means to submit or surrender to the way of God. Jesus wanted his hearers, then, now, and in the future, to submit and to return, Hebrew shuv, or teshuva, to the divine way leading to the Abba. Abba is the father, mother, God in one. Finally, we have the word enuma. Shockingly to most, Jesus did not ask us to believe in any certain idea. And he certainly did not ask us to believe in him as the only son of God. This is dogma. Jesus did not teach a dogma. The Greek pistis is the word translated as believe. This translation greatly distorts the whole message or basur of Mar Yeshua. The Hebrew Aramaic word would have been enuma, which comes from the translateral root amin. Enuma means to be faithful to, to have fidelity with, or to do the basor. The basor was something you did, not something you believed in. It was something you acted upon. It wasn't just a mere mental construct. So, Enuma means to be faithful to, to have fidelity with, or to do the boss or the divine way leading to a return to the Abba. Jesus's historical teaching had nothing to do with belief, but had a lot to do with doing. <laughs> doing the spiritual practices he recommended for personal sanctification and purification and for the upliftment of all humanity. It was a universal message not a dogmatic one, as, mo as is most oftenly taught, unfortunately. So one more term here to clarify is the basor. The Greek uangelion was translated to English as good news or gospel. Good news or gospel is basor in Aramaic which is the spiritual proclamation received by a prophet from God during the ecstatic experience of a Merkaba ascent. So unspinning the basur of Mar Yeshua. Here would be my interpretation of this with the Aramaic words inside. The time is fulfilled and the Malkuth of God has come near. Naham and Enuma, the Basur. The time, age, or season is fulfilled, and the sovereignty of God has come near. Submit to God and have fidelity with and act upon the Basur.
That is what that really means in Jesus's thought world. Summation of Mar Yeshua's Basur, his message. Mar Yeshua experienced an ecstatic Merkaba ascent. He ascended to the throne of God and received a message for all humanity, regardless of religion, caste, nationality, sexual orientation, or gender. The time has come for God's Malkuth, God's rulership and guidance to manifest on the earth, which would herald natural, cultural, societal, and spiritual evolutions unimagined. This time began with Jesus's Basur a few millennia ago and slowly is coming to fruition over a long period of time. It is still in process of slow continual growth today. Now, when you hear and understand this is the time to lovingly submit to and faithfully practice God's divine way as is paraphrased in this Basur and elaborated in Mar Yeshua's Halakha, his specific teachings and practices recommended to his disciples, past, present, and future. Amen. Amen. Amen.